Okay, hi everyone. So welcome to our 31st session of the Met AI Group Exchange. This week, we have Jeffrey Gu from Stanford University with us to present his research on using hyperbolic representations for biomedical image segmentation. Jeffrey is currently a second year PhD student in the Institute for Computational and Mathematical Engineering at Stanford. His research interests include representation learning, unsupervised learning, biomedical applications, and beyond. Thank you, Jeffrey, for joining us today. Before we start, do you have any preference on how you want to take it? questions? Uh, yeah, I think if you have a question, you can interrupt anytime and uh, ask. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. All right. So um, as always, let's always try to make this session as interactive as possible with a good audience participation. Okay. Over to Jeffrey. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, so today I'll be uh, talking about our recent NeurIPS 2021 paper uh, capturing implicit hierarchical structure in 3D biomedical images with self-supervised hyperbolic representations, which is a joint work with Joy Su, Gong Ker Wu, Hua Chiu, and Serena Young. And yeah, so first we'll talk a bit about the background and motivation. So um, basic advances in biomedical engineering, sorry, biomedical imaging have revolutionized uh, like the amount of images we can capture. So here are a few. Um, here's cryo, uh, cryo cryogenic electron microscopy, uh, CT scan, MRI, and PET scan. And uh, but um, so neural networks can automate uh, segmentation of these objects, but um, it's quite. It requires usually requires like large label data sets and they can be quite costly to generate. So here's some that actually we've done, uh, I've done some with hand, by hand with some of our collaborators uh, on the project um, doing virus segmentation. So um, you can see it's like quite time intensive to, you know, draw all these, to label all the pixels and um, also to figure out, you know, which pixels are positive and negative uh, examples. Yeah, so um, especially for 3D segmentation, acquiring the data is very difficult and costly. So um, per, like doing the annotations per pixel are much more expensive than say uh, like classification where there's only one label per image or per volume. And um, there's a lot of uh, repeated effort since you would have to do it since usually it's presented as 2D slices, the like 3D volume will be presented as 2D slices and you need to so there's a lot of repeated effort that of annotating 2D slices that are basically the same. And uh, for a biomedical domain, it usually requires some kind of domain expertise to uh, create the cor correct labels. And finally, um, data sets are usually specific to a single task. Like for example, let's say like one of the tasks we will eventually like show evaluation on is uh, brain tumor segmentation, but the model will be uh, specialized to this one task. So acquiring data for all these different domains is even harder since we have to do this process over and over. Also for tasks such as scientific discovery, which is one of the things we want to do with um, event, we may want to do eventually, uh, we can't produce labels at all, or we might not want to produce labels at all due to like two reasons. First of all is um, it might lead to bias. For example, if we want to kind of try to suck uh, segment uh, unknown structure or a structure where things, there's not much known about it. Um, we might introduce our own bias of what it already looks like if we create uh, manual annotations. And second of all, if you know we don't know much about the structure at all, we may not know like the extent of this object. So it might be hard to produce um, any labels at all. So one example is, um, I think there are collaborators uh, of our lab working to segment um, structures that aren't that well understood from cryogenic electron microscopy uh, images. So many works have uh, kind of tried to get around this um, difficulty by considering semi-supervised um, 3D segmentation, but there's not been that much work done on uh, on li very limited work done on unsupervised 3D segmentation. And here's two examples of two methods that use uh, limited data and 
So this is a 3D unit on the left, and this is a, like a one-shot one shot, um, model from Zaho et al. Yeah, so uh, our work is based on a few ideas. So first is um, we can do unsupervised learning using self-supervised learning. It's kind, um, we'll get into later, but basically the summary of self-supervised learning is that we'll try to learn on a, try to learn representations on a different task, which is called a pretext task. So it could be something like um, uh, divide the image up into sections and then learn like what order each piece comes in. So like, for example, we can number the sections from one, two, three, et cetera. And then the idea is that not that this task is, you know, very useful, but somehow that the representations learned in this neural network will be useful. And then we may be able to fine tune or transfer learn, you know, something um, of that sort. Uh -huh. And then uh, the second is that kind of biomedical images are inherently hierarchical. So um, I think the inspiration of this is kind of like cell images from cryogenic electron microscopy, where the cell has a hierarchy where, you know, there is the whole cell on the highest level at the root and, you know, at the mid level, maybe like a mitochondria and then at lower level might be the substructures of this mitochondria, for example, Christe and Isera. And then the last idea is um, hyperbolic representations are like kind of designed or are well suited to learning hierarchical data. And finally, um, you can also look kind of learn the structure with um, these like self-supervised approaches. Yeah, so here's just a few examples um, where of what like kind of inspires us. So I guess on the right is like a cell, so like all these cells structure sorry, all these like substructures and then, which have, I guess some of them have even smaller substructures inside of them. And here's like the mitochondria on the bottom. And here's like a example from this uh, brain tumor segmentation data set that we evaluate on, which also looks uh, quite a bit hierarchical and that, um, you know, there's like this large yellow region, which uh, may include these like smaller regions as well. And there's like even smaller regions inside. And um, yeah, seems like something that may uh, be a, have, you know, some hierarchical structure we can uh, exploit. Could I, could so, I just make a comment mm -hmm. uh, um, about that last slide, the, uh, the brain tumor. There isn't really a hierarchy there. Um, it's, it's a heterogeneous tumor. There's some edema around it. Well, I mean, I guess if you consider the edema surrounding it to be a part of a hierarchy, perhaps you could think of it that way, but it, it's not a hierarchy the way the other images show where, you know, like all cells will have mitochondria and nuclei and things like that. Um, but a brain tumor doesn't necessarily have the different components that are in different colors uh, in, the, in the image at the upper left. I just wanted to make sure you understood that just because something has a bunch of uh, components doesn't mean it's due to some uh, uh, structured hierarchy. It could just be that it's a heterogeneous object. All right, yeah, I think that's a good point. And maybe we can um, get to it later when we talk about um, hyperbolic representations, yeah, and when they're useful. Thanks. So um, yeah, so now um, I guess we can talk about hyperbolic representation. So I guess I'll just try to give a bit of introduction to hyperbolic space and uh, why it might be useful. So it's a negative curvature space, which um, constant negative, which kind of means the geometry is different. And people have found that this actually leads to the ability to um, represent different types of data uh, better. So here's like a picture which shows kind of uh, different curvatures and what it looks like geometrically. So um, here's like a sphere, which is like positive curvature, flat space, which has zero curvature, Euclidean space, I guess, and then hyperbolic space, which has negative curvature. And so um, hyperbolic space has five different models. 
but really for machine learning, only two are used. And you can think of them as different ways of assigning coordinates to the same hyperbolic space. So actually these three pictured models and the other two are actually all equivalent and there's a way to like transform between um, all five. But uh, there's, I guess, certain advantages to using different models, uh, which we'll get to. And only the Poincaré ball and the hyperboloid model or Lorentz model is really um, common in uh, machine learning algorithms. So the Poincaré ball is um, it's a unit. So it's all it's a unit ball. So all it consists of all the points less than less uh, norm less than one. And it has this distance function. And um, as you can see, uh, kind of this makes the geometry a lot different than um, Euclidean space. So you can think of the edge of this circle as, as being at like infinity, since it'll have like infinite distance, it'll have infinite distance from say the center. Um, so points actually never reach this edge, um, but they can get really close. For example, here's the embedding of a tree in hyperbolic space and actually has very unique, the hyperbolic space has very unique properties regarding trees. And um, here are other things. So here are parallel lines in uh, this Poincaré ball model. So I think hopefully this should convince you that kind of the geometry is different. And then because the geometry and distance function is different, it might be able to model uh, different measures of similarity between objects. And here are uh, what are called geodesics of this Poincaré disk. But um, you can think of them as like the, equivalent of straight lines in um, normal space. So these are like the shortest distance paths between two points. And as you can see, generally they're either diameters um, or like circular arcs that kind of are orthogonal, you know, at this intersection point to the outer rim of the disc. And the hyperboloid model is um, similar. So you can think uh, like the Poincaré ball kind of, if this, um, Kind of this, this picture of this uh, like paraboloid continues upward. Like the rim would be like would be um, at you know at the very top. And here's like on the right is like a picture of how you would transform between these things, which maybe shows it better. But uh, um, the actual hyperboloid model is defined by um, all the points that kind of satisfy this equation. Uh, and I think it gets um, its name like the Lorentz model from physics. Um, so yeah, and then um, geometry is quite a bit different. So for example, um, if you have a triangle in this hyperbolic space, the sum of the angles is less than 180 degrees. So in flat space, sorry, it's Jeff, exactly wait, so... 100. Oh, sorry, yes. Sorry, one quick question. I'm very interested in that. Like that's why. So one quick question said, why did you start modeling in a hyperbolic space rather than spherical? Because ideally, since you're working with um, 3D volumetric method, I would imagine that spherical would be the most closest one, right? Uh, yeah, so I think we'll get to that. But I guess the short reason is that um, for uh, objects that have, um, like a hierarchy, um, somehow it's uh, the, in, the, if you try to embed it into hyperbolic space, um, like for example, like a tree, like if you could represent your data by like a tree, it would actually embed much, with a much lower error into this hyperbolic space than say Euclidean space. So um, yeah, so I think that's um, hopefully uh, the rest of the, for subsequent slides should make that more clear, but if it doesn't, um, feel free to like ask like, uh, again. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, um, so the original motivation is kind of, you know, so uh, geodesics, you know, have kind of this circular shape or our diameters and yeah. Uh, so the idea is a kind of the hyperbolic space is a continuous version of a tree. And so there's a, you know, mathematical paper that says, um, you know, the trees can embed into hyperbolic space. It's arbitrarily low error, but not into Euclidean space. So that's kind of this image here on the left. And then um, the surface area of like a disk will grow exponentially, kind of like the leaves of the tree, which I guess is kind of the intuitive reason why 
you why a tree should embed into hyperbolic space with a arbitrarily low error. And then, but the difference is that hyperbolic space is uh, smooth and actually you can kind of do optimization and um, gradient updates on this space. So um, unlike a tree, um, it's discrete. You can't, it would be, it's, you can't directly, you know, use like gradient descent or any of these um, methods common for machine learning directly on it. And yeah, so here is some, um, so in machine learning, I think it seems like the first people to consider hyperbolic representations are, um, is, is in a paper by Nicole and Kilo. And what they did, one of the things they did was to represent natural language tasks. So here's um, an embedding they created of um, all the WordNet. Um, so WordNet is like a natural language data set. Um, and uh, of all the, all the terms in this WordNet data set um, that are kind of like subset of mammal or like, I guess, lower in the hierarchy than mammal. So, if, so they managed to embed this at the center and then they find that, you know, it embeds really nicely and, you know, like canine and, you know, embeds here and then like all the specific dogs embed close to the edge and similarly for like rodent and ungulate. And so I think that's pretty interesting. And then people have used them for a variety of tasks. So here it's um, MNIST. Um, uh, and um, I guess this image is a little blurry, so it's hard to see like how they uh, how it works. But here is also um, like cell development um, from I think C. elegans, uh, I guess cell lines. And you can see that um, they also find like interesting representations, which um, I guess, yeah, I don't know too much about this field. So, but I think it seems very intuitive, I guess, that kind of the cell lines would get more and more specific. I guess that's how I interpret this image, but we can discuss this um, if, or if uh, later, yeah. And then including images. So here's a paper that also does this. So they also put the MNIST stages, but they also put a data set called Omniglot, which is um, includes the letters of different languages, as well as I believe some made up languages, some made up symbols. So um, yeah, we can probably take a closer look at this um, later if you want, but I guess like kind of the similar looking up similar looking symbols are kind of grouped together under this um, hyperbolic embedding. And finally, um, they also give this intuition of similar to us um, that for images, um, you can do this, you get a hierarchy from part to whole, but you also have this, um, they also uh, give this idea that perhaps that image degradation may also lead to a hierarchy um, so you can see like this degraded image is, I guess, um, has this hierarchy with these other two images below it. Um, and we can discuss that uh, later if, if there's, if we're, if we have time, yeah. And then finally, um, uh, due to the usefulness or due to the interest in um, hyperbolic representations, people have actually created a bunch of machine learning methods. So people have translated all the, um, all the traditional neural network architectures to work with hyperbolic space. So there's feed for networks and there's a couple of papers. Uh, yeah, this list is probably not exhaustive. So there's probably many other works that aren't included, but there's like feed forward or like multi-layer per perception networks. There's been proposals for um, convolutional neural networks, which is a kind of contemporary contemporaneous to our work. Um, recurrent neural networks, a variational on encoder, which of work which we build on, and also graph convolutional neural networks. And there's many more that you know um, can't be listed here. And yeah, so finally we can get to some math. So these are kind of the building blocks of these aforementioned methods, which um, 
uh, translate these traditional neural network architectures to hyperbolic space. So some of the ones that maybe that uh, some of the operations they use are uh, Mobius addition, which you can think of as kind of the analog to vector addition in Euclidean space, but it's not not precisely because um, that's, it's not a vector space, for example, in hyperbolic space. And then there's these exponential and logarithm maps, which are really important as a good way to map from um, traditional like flat Euclidean space, Rn, you know, vectors from what vectors onto um, uh, hyperbolic space. So here, it's, these are equations are for the Poincare ball model we looked at earlier. And then the logarithm is just the inverse map. Um, so this is just a way to map back from uh, the hyperbolic space into Euclidean space. And here's just some um, visualizations. So on the left is this uh, Mobius edition. And this is kind of, you know, where the points would end up if you did this Mobius edition. And on the right is um, the exponential map. So uh, how it works is um, how the map is defined is that if you start at a point and you start in a direction, the exponential map will walk along this direction on the curve for like uh, one step. And then the logarithm map is just inverse. So just go back to this. So uh, we'll just go back to our direction. And as we'll see, like the architectures um, make a lot of use of, uh, if you look at like at these papers, they'll make a lot of use of these operations to define how it works. And here's just like a summary of things. And for both of these uh, models of hyperbolic geometry, I mentioned earlier. So here are kind of like the formulas for uh, useful maps. And here's- Can I ask um, a question here? Mm -hmm. um, so is there, what's the difference or like, is there any like advantage of one of these models versus the other? Concrete ball versus- um, Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there are, I think there are some advantages and disadvantages and um, I can just go over that now. So if we go back to where we have kind of the pictures of this space. So as you can see, uh, this space is kind of uh, like finite on like this space, like, so the, sorry, Poincare ball is finite, whereas this space will expand, expand, extend like upwards to, you know, to infinity basically, it will keep growing. So that makes um, the Poincare ball particularly nice for our, uh, visualizations like this one. So this is done in the Poincare ball and you can see there's a nice visualization. I also think that because um, these close, like many of the points end up being very close to the edge. Um, uh, it might, I, I, I'm wondering if maybe convergence might be better in um, the Poincare ball model than hyperboloid because if you were to learn this, sorry, I'm going the wrong way, but uh, if you were learn to if you were to learn trying to a similar um, uh, a similar kind of visual if you're trying to do a similar type of embedding in hyperbolic space the um, like training it might push the representations close further and further away so um, you know might not converge. Um, and I think but the main advantage of this hyperbolic model is that, there's like numerical instability, I, which I think is associated with the fact that kind of this edge is at infinity and like things grow really fast, uh, like basically like the distance and other things will grow very fast at the edge. So um, if you're looking for like numerically stable um, way to do the, to train these models, um, I think the hyperbolic space has advantages there. So Jeffrey, I have a quick question as well. Uh, yeah. Maybe you'll talk about this later in your talk, but I uh, mm -hmm. just wanted to ask. Um, so is the way you train a hyperbolic network um, that you, you first get a Euclidean latent space and then project it onto a hyperbolic space, or do you do the optimization end-to-end -end in the hyperbolic space? Yeah, so, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, with these different architectures, there is, so some of them are designed to be end-to-end, um, -end, like starting with a hyperbolic representation and mm -hmm. um, you know, doing all the 
optimization in hyperbolic space. And there's, you know, special um, optimizers and things like actually designed to do that. I see. Um, and, uh, but I think some other methods usually um, may have like a, you know, if they want to take in input that's in Euclidean space, they'll have like a map at the very beginning that will map it. And it's usually um, the simplest way to do it is just to um, take your uh, Euclidean vectors and just apply the exponential map to it. And then mm -hmm. the results will all be in hyperbolic. So that's like one simple way that you might want to like map. So I think there, um, if I remember correctly, um, there's a paper that does this. Um, one of the papers does this. Yeah, and I, see. I guess, okay. Yeah, hopefully that, yeah. Yeah, that answers my question, thank okay. you. Yeah, and if you, here below, you can kind of see that, uh, like I described, um, the building blocks as, such as matrix vector multiplication, adding a bias and an activation are all def defined using um, these uh, exponential and logarithmic maps. And sometimes, you know, the Mobius addition, um, as since it's used to define like some of these maps or to simplify the formula for some of these maps. Uh, yeah. So now I guess we'll also talk about self-supervised learning as a bit of motivation to our eventual methods. So um, yeah, so a big idea of this pretext of super self-supervised learning is to have a pretext task, which you described earlier. And it's kind of a task that's learned solely for the purpose of generating a good representation. So one, I think simple example that uh, may be familiar to most people here is variation autoencoder, where you can think of the pretext task as a, um, reconstructing uh, the image, uh, you know, using a bottleneck. And here's like a diagram of how that works. And this is one of the major like paradigms from supervised learning. And we'll get to um, some examples here. So um, the left, top left, bottom left, and bottom right are kind of earlier works. And um, so here is they cut up the image into different patches and they assign them an order. And the goal is to predict what order the patches come in based on these numbers. Um, and then here's another variation where they cut up the image into kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. And then they want to, they like mix it up and they want to return the right order where the image comes back. And in this bottom right, um, they crop out a section of the image and the goal is to kind of like fill this in. So this is called in-painting. And, and these are kind of precursor works to some a topic that's really hot right now, which is called contrastive learning, which is given by like a, this diagram of kind of how um, the networks are trained uh, in the top right. So uh, the idea of contrastive learning is to apply is given an image, apply two different data augmentations, for example, like a random crop and a random flip um, to both, and then say, okay, the representation of these two images should be the same because they're the same image, just like slightly changed, or, you know, they might change the color a little bit. And it, people have found that this works really well in creating um, unsupervised representations that can then be fine-tuned for, say, classification or segmentation or um, any other downstream tasks. Uh, and they find that this works really well um, for like 2D natural images. So for example, they would train these with ImageNet or another large uh, image data set. And it's um, kind of like uh, one example of this idea. And yeah, so our goal is to kind of try to reconstruct this hierarchy. And we're, like we've talked about before, before, just kind of like a part whole relationship or um, uh, like whole fragment uh, relationship. So we kind of use this idea that um, uh, given a parent volume and it's a and it's sub volume, we would like them really like the representations of these to be close. Uh, and then we would like the representation of a volume that doesn't overlap uh, the larger volume. So in this case, at V, V is the large volume. S is a smaller volume that is totally sits totally inside V, and T is a volume that is does not intersect V, and hopefully is like on the other side of the image or other side of the volume. Um, I I have a, another quick question here. Yeah. So this part whole relation uh, relationship, like, do you know 
do you know this relationship beforehand um like how do you do it in an unsupervised way um, yeah so here we have a so we don't know we don't know but we use like a sampling scheme to try to um get as close as possible to the part whole relationship we think it should have but i agree that um this method is not quite as precise as like the natural language counterpart we saw earlier where um for example k9 is for sure like a we know for sure it's a sub it's just like a sub category i guess of mammal mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps that's you know one of the weaknesses of these hyperbolic representations where you know if there's some kind of ambiguity or something in uh you know maybe it could work less well that may lead to it working less well um but yeah so we do this using a triplet loss and uh we uh i guess we'll give an exact mathematical formulation of this triplet loss later when we talk about our method um which yeah we can which it looks like this. So um, as before, we have a variational autoencoder and we augment it with this hierarchical triplet loss, which hopefully can kind of um, learn a better representation by taking advantage of this structure. So we'll, we'll walk through um, how it works. So first um, we have this sampling scheme where we'll sample um, the large volume, which we called V earlier. And a smaller subvolume, which is called um, S, I believe. And then we also sample a T um, that's hopefully, you know, that's uh, for sure non overlapping, but also hopefully, you know, far away. So um, the idea is that, you know, um, far away in the image, it's um, unlikely to look similar. So perhaps if we take the cells, our example, you know, we may find some different part. Uh, of the cell there, whereas here it might be, say, the nucleus and you know some uh, some sub volume of the nucleus, and then we feed it through a, a convolutional uh, VAE. So the encoder and decoder are convolutions, and actually uh, the representations here, as we'll see. Oh, um, I guess uh, um, as we'll see here are in hyperbolic space. So actually, methods have been developed to kind of uh, sample and use the, and I guess, use the reparameterization -par trick for training um, variation autoencoders in hyperbolic space. Um, and then here we have this um, new gyroplane convolutional layer, but um, you can uh, think of this as basically a uh, hyperbolic convolution that takes advantage of this gyroplane operation, which is defined in a previous paper as kind of a analog of the hyperbolic, uh, like hyperbolic matrix vector operation. So, and then um, it works uh, much the same way as uh, the standard convolution, which is like a sliding window and it applies like um, this, uh, basically like a dot product, or you can think of it as a, uh, convolution correlation operation, except the correlation operation is given by this uh, gyro vector operation, which is given by this formula and it was defined earlier in an earlier paper by Genia et al. And finally, um, yeah, so here's a picture that kind of represents um, our ideal scenario, but I agree like um, like Nandita mentioned earlier there, you know, it may not be so precise in the case of images. Um, but we hope for that the larger patch, um, you know, belongs to this hierarchy, and this is part of the sub hierarchy of this. And then the far away is in a different hierarchy that corresponds to maybe another um, object. So that's our goal with this, and we uh, and right. So that's um, explained in this picture as well. Um, so uh, just to reiterate um, the large patch is um, the sampled anchor. Um, so that's V from earlier. The light, the light uh, red, red patch is a uh, positive child and the light blue patch is a negative child. And we want them to, uh, we create a loss such that um, the representations um, are 
have this organization. And um, we can talk about the precise sampling, maybe if there's time at the end, or if anyone has a question. And the triple loss, so this is a standard kind of triple loss. So the idea is that um, we want the um, distance between the two representation, representations we want to be close to be small. And since we have a subtraction, we want this to be, uh, we want the distance between the positive and the negative examples to be large. So um, in hyperbolic space, this has this interpretation, especially because um, if you remember from earlier, or I guess if you look at this formula, kind of these different branches are kind of, it's not like, it's uh, a bit different from Euclidean space in that these branches are kind of very far apart in Euclidean space. They might be like exponentially far apart. Um, so that's kind of the goal. And then this alpha term is just kind of a margin to keep things like a bit more well separated. Um, and then finally, um, there's a question of how we actually do the create a segmentation mask. And what we do is uh, um, once we generate representations for each uh, pixel, um, each pixel, we generate a representation by taking the local context. So like a patch around each pixel, and then we feed it through the network and generate representation. And then we cluster these representations in hyperbolic space to produce the segmentation mass. So, and the main idea here is that we need some special um, clustering algorithm to respect the different geometry of this space as opposed to Euclidean space. So. Um, uh, we don't use, say, Euclidean k-means, we use like a hyperbolic version of k-means. But actually in our experiments, the actual difference between hyperbolic and Euclidean k-means was not very large. So maybe that's something we can discuss. Um, but it, yeah, that's an interesting thing we found. Yeah. So we have some evaluation on different um, data sets. So we have a toy data set of which we have um, a simple example where the shapes are a bit, you know, simple, and then another um, irregular one where we add a noise. Uh, this Brad's brain tumor data set and qualitative examples on this cryogenic electron tomography data set. So here's a picture of the toy data set. So uh, as you can see, we have a large thing and it's kind of inspired by a cell, though of course the shapes are not, are much simpler. Um, so we have this large circle, which you can think of as, um, representing a cell. And then we have these little substructures in between that have little substructures in between them. So for example, uh, this big cube has two little cubes inside of it. And this big circle has uh, two little circles inside it, though due to like uh, the pixels, uh, kind of looks like a square <laughs> in these slices. Yeah, due to like, yeah, the, the fact that these are just like 50 by 50 by 50, like pixel grids, yeah. And um, how we evaluate is um, we evaluate at different, the segmentation quality at different levels. So the first level, which we call level one is just the foreground and background. So just the cell and the background. Uh, so I, so I, I guess I forgot to mention, but actually the bottom is the ground truth and this is um, what it looks like. So uh, in this data set, we have like a bit of texture going on and like um, some noise and things like that. So, uh, and then level two is um, the background, the large circle and the two medium sized circle and square. Um, and then at the lowest level, um, it's uh, everything. So it's including the small squares, um, the medium squares, the, sorry, the medium shapes and the large circle in the background. So this task is, task is pretty hard. I would say level three is pretty hard, especially unsupervised. And that's kind of, why we see like the numbers decreasing. But yeah, so you can see um, in our method uh, compared to competitors, um, we're doing a lot better um, and almost close to, um, close to, uh, so on top are semi-supervised methods and on the bottom are 3D unsupervised methods. And one method um, that's originally designed for 2D, but we um, convert to 3D. Um, and we can see that performance is uh, generally a lot better than these other competing methods, but um, not always that close to semi-supervised methods. 
So some of my supervised methods have some. And here's um, the irregular one, which is much the same, except now it's actually difficult. It's much more, the shape is much more difficult to, um, I guess, segment. And we see um, very similar results uh, here. And finally, we also see um, ablations where we see in general that our contributions are effective. So both this uh, hierarchical triplet loss and this um, gyro plane layer we, we add are effective, as well as um, hyperbolic representations being better than Euclidean representations overall. Um, quick question about the ablation mm -hmm. studies. Right. So with the Euclidean space, did you have the same pretext task um, as you had in the hyperbolic right. one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Right, so um, to I guess um, to, uh, maybe I didn't explain every row. So um, the base configuration is um, only the VAE. So it does not include this, our pretext task that we think should give extra uh, super self supervision to the task. So triplet is a, uh, um, so the triplet loss could be formulated with just the distance function uh, as we, uh, as we <laughs> see before. We could just replace the distance here with either the hyperbolic distance or Euclidean distance, and uh, we would get different types of triplet loss. So um, that's this configuration. You can see that it's pretty helpful. And yeah, we can see it's also pretty helpful over the base configuration for hyperbolic as well, the hyperbolic space as well. And I guess we compare like for like, we can generally see that. Um, so for example, just learning hyperbolic representations alone mm -hmm. has some effectiveness. Um, adding this new layer that kind of, so the, what this layer is supposed to do is kind of uh, take into account the geometry of this um, VAE because um, in our method um, only uh, to clarify only this layer, uh, only the layers in this uh, green color, uh, green blue color is in hyperbolic space. The rest is actually Euclidean, like normal convolutional layers. So um, we add this layer to kind of like better handle the geometry of this um, re latent representation. So we can see that that's also um, generally, oh, sorry, where are the ablations? Yeah, we can also see that that's generally effective over and the triplet loss is generally effective. And then the combination is also generally effective. Though here, it's a little less, uh, less, you know, it seems like, the like synergistic effect is not as much as you would expect from just the effect alone of each component. Um, and here is um, on the brain tumor segmentation data set, so kind of the same comparison. And we actually do much better. We also, here we do significantly better than um, these competing methods. And uh, we actually do better than some semi-supervised data set, which uses some labels, which is surprising. And um, here's some extra evaluation methods. So here is Hausdorff distance. So this chart left is Hausdorff distance. And here's kind of uh, um, a picture of how it's computed. I guess the picture is not too descriptive, but um, basically the idea of Hausdorff distance is kind of that the Hausdorff distance is zero if this Blue, this uh, blue outline exactly matches this green outline and it gets worse and worse as kind of like the, um, sorry, as like the corresponding points get farther apart, um, the how storage distance is worse and worse. So it's kind of a measure of like how exactly on the shape you are. And um, we see that we also can improve over these unsupervised methods uh, in both the average and the 95 percentile, which is like common for this data set. And then here is, um, Here's kind of how it, how the how the, what the data set has learned. So somehow it, uh, the data set understands that um, where the brain is, like what the background is, where the brain is, and also um, where this white um, structure is. And finally, here's a qualitative example from cryogenic electron tomography. So. Um, this uh, on the left is a picture, a cryogenic electron microscopy tomogram of uh, a mitochondria. And then we see that kind of, it seems like the uh, 
hyperbolic um, unsupervised hyperbolic segmentation seems more reasonable than the Euclidean representation. Uh, but yeah, I guess it's open to interpretation. Um, yeah, and finally, um, um, the summary is that uh, we use this self-supervised objective to create useful representations by reconstructing this um, parts to whole or part to or whole to fragment hierarchy among subvolumes. And to better model the hierarchy, we use hyperbolic representations, which um, uh, due to which due to the geometry of hyperbolic space is well suited um, to modeling hierarchical data, hierarchical data. And then finally, we do some demonstrations on biomedical images. And then finally, uh, yeah, here is uh, acknowledgments from our, our, my co to my co-authors um, on this work. And our paper can be found in this link. And finally, uh, yeah, here's some slides for discussion. So um, I think the strength of our work is that it's flexible with regards to um, the data input data type. So the input data didn't need to be biomedical, uh, but we have only considered it so far for biomedical data. And the encoder and decoder architectures are also flexible. So um, uh, we could replace the parts with um, any, any uh, encoder and decoder um, architecture. And also we're demonstrating the usefulness of these representations, at least in some cases. Uh, and finally, um, some ideas or some things to discuss for future work, um, maybe um, to evaluate more diverse domains uh, than what we have, um, to try to close the gap between semi-supervised methods, which are generally superior and, or which are almost always superior, I guess, except in one of our experiments. And to understand where they're useful, um, both in like computer vision and, or in the field of computer vision. Uh, and then to finally improve methods for these hyperbolic representations in computer vision. So it hasn't been investigated very much. In general, these representations haven't been investigated very much for computer vision. So I, I also, so the methods also aren't there. So only recently has um, someone proposed a convolutional architecture for um, these, but it seems to be uh, a lot of room to improve if these hyperbolic representations um, can be found to be useful for computer vision. And I think that's the end of my talk. So um, thanks for coming and uh, maybe we can move on to questions uh, or discussion. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much, Jeffrey, for the talk. It's a very interesting method for uh, 3D segmentation. Is any does anyone have any questions here? Um, I Let's can start. give Jeffrey a uh, uh, virtual applause first. <laughs> Sorry. Oh right. Virtual applause for you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nandita, go ahead. Ah uh, yeah. Hi. Um, I had. I think that was a great talk, Jeffrey. I had a couple of questions. You briefly touched upon the. Um, sampling strategies for the self-supervised uh, pretext task. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what kind of heuristics you used for, um, like how how far in in the volume is a negative sample versus how close within your anchor is the positive sample, and, and those kind of things. Because it did yeah. seem like it was giving a big boost in even in the Euclidean space. Yeah, so I guess we don't have that. I guess you have to refer to our paper for the actual equations. But in general, um, I think our strategy is to kind of sample the positive child on kind of a logarith logarithmic scale. Mm -hmm. And I think the, or my uh, intuition for this is kind of that um, kind of the size, if you actually have a hierarchy where there's like big objects containing little objects and little, these little objects containing even smaller objects, um, kind of the uh, scale of the, sh the shape will kind of like reduce exponentially. Like the large, the medium sized object might be half of the large object. And then, you know, the smaller object might be like a third of the 
you know did you need to model the the size of the like you had four different data sets and i'm guessing the yeah. size of each object and each of these data sets might have differed so did you have to model that into the sampling strategies or um you just used, yeah. used one kind of thing yeah since it's unsupervised it's um you know it's difficult for us to really set like a parameter since um, there's uh, we can't really inform mm -hmm. uh, beforehand we can't really inform like the algorithm of how big to expect the object so I think um, generally we have actually we have two different sampling schemes one is this logarithmic one mentioned and the other one is uniform mm -hmm. and we've kind of used a uniform for these like smaller toy did for this smaller sorry uh, yeah, for the smaller toy problem, which is like 50 by 50 by 50. Mm -hmm. But for example, for th these Tom graphs, it's like 256 by 1024 by 1024, depending on the how much you pin it. So you can, the resolution can be changed. But I see. For these a lot larger, we use this logarithmic scale. And I think uh, that's because um, on these really large, we, ex uh, we expect a variation, I guess, in size to be larger, whereas here it's a bit more. You know the variation size can't be that large because mm -hmm. it's not the image is not so big. Uh, yes, yeah, but we can. I think um, practically. Uh, sorry, let me get back to the sampling slide. But I think practically, you can try out either one of these and see which one works better uh, for your case. Um, Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is there any reason why you chose to model it using Poincaré ball versus? other than uh, the, the other model. Yeah. Um, I think first is um, it's a lot more interpretable. So um, ho we hopefully uh, in the future, we can also try to like interpret these things too. Um, and second of all, I think it's um, the state of the methods is mostly that um, especially v, for VA, VAME methods, they seem to be mostly developed for this Poincaré ball. Um, so uh, yeah, so in particular, there's um, this need to like reparameterize the distributions and um, the, ma uh, the main paper, which we build on, which kind of gives some reparameterization schemes is using this Poincaré ball. So, uh, we found it uh, also a bit more convenient to use the Poincaré ball because yeah, the previous previous methods have um, worked out some of um, like uh, the, I guess this parameterization scheme for us, and also they also um, in this paper propose um, uh, basically a new distribution and a sampling reparam re sampling and reparameterization schemes for that so. We kind of don't need to reinvent the wheel if we want to like test out different distributions as well. Mm -hmm. I see. Jeff, yeah, so, one quick, one quick question for you. That um, so, since the Brad data set also it's not really isometric. Did you did you have to interpolate? Uh, interpolate. Uh, the sorry, can you explain what you mean by isometric? Because the um, uh, the thing is that uh, like the z axis of this volume, they are in the different dimensions of X and Y. So in your mm -hmm. images, you always sh show the isometric volume. So did you have to interpolate the MRI volumes? Um, I don't think we took into, I don't think we took that into account, but maybe, you know. Because you understand, right? These MRI, MRI are really not 3D, right? These are right. actually 2D, but thin slice, right? right. Mm -hmm because they are capturing 2D and the Z axis is always not equal size of X and Y. I see, yeah. Um, that's a great question. Um, so for our method, we actually don't take in this into account, but, and um, actually, so for some of the previous methods I've read on this topic, it seems like they also do not take into account the possibly irregular spacing either. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be an interesting question because my guess is that it doesn't matter for this method. Mm. Because I, I, I'm i just curious because if it's a hyperbolic, so hopefully it should not matter, but um, yeah, I don't know. 
if you guys tried that. Yeah, no, that's a great um, suggestion. Um, yeah, I'd be very interested to know the results, but um, I'm guess I'm yeah I'm guessing since like Chris said since the hyperbolic representation is between like patches of the image, okay. uh, it doesn't like the spacing between the it, layers of each patch may not change much. Like knowing the spacing may not change much the hyperbolic representation. And do you also try the cases where actually the, the your hierarchies actually overlaps? For example, imagine that in, in, an, in one case, I'm just gi giving you an example. I don't know if that exactly that particular case exists in Bratz or not, right? Like core and Im imagine idema Im Im overlaps. Do you, do you try for those kind of cases where the hierarchy doesn't really follow the similar subset concept? Yeah, so, hmm, we, yeah, so I think for our demonstrations, we've tried for the most part to uh, avoid ambiguity just as you know to demonstrate a okay. method but yeah i think that's a great question for maybe discussion and also future work is that you know if there's some overlap or i guess also uh, ambiguity you know how well these kinds of methods would work because i think you know practically speaking it sounds like that will often be the case right yeah um, uh, yeah, uh, you probably have a lot more experience with these images than I do. So, uh, but yeah, I imagine practically it's usually the case. And yeah, I think it's, it would be interesting to see how it works. How hard is it to get started with um, these, um, you know, working with these uh, representations? Like, are there, do you implement like the gyroplane convolutions on your own? Uh, is it is it hard to work with the gyro vectors? Uh, hmm. I think there are first, um, there's been several libraries written that will, that I think are also like deep learning compatible. So um, I think that's a good place to start. Um, uh, also, um, yeah, since the formulas, you know, there are formulas for, I guess this is not a complete list of all the formulas, but um, the it's also not too bad because, you know, the, a lot of the papers are very clear like on the formulas. I think the main thing is to watch out for, um, uh, if you're trying to implement all these formulas from scratch is to watch out that, you know, there may be some numerical instability um, due to kind of these fu the functions they use and also like these denominators. Yeah, they're, they're uh, so pretty gnarly. In practice, you may have to like <laughs> use this formula and also like clamp or something, clamp the range of these things to make sure there's no numerical instability. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, but I believe there are like, if you just want to kind of uh, not implement from scratch, there are libraries that will kind of implement already, you know, uh, sorry, for example, these functions, yeah. Um, so maybe yeah, uh, I can send a link after uh, of some libraries that may be helpful. Oh yeah, that, that would be, that would be great. You know, it's, you know, if, it's always nice to hear that, that it's a pretty gnarly space to work in, so. Right, um, yeah. It seems so. like a lot. Like when uh, I can remember, you know, doing this by hand, like for a Minkowski space, and you just had to keep track of many, many, many things. And it was very easy to do the, do it wrong. Sam. So, right, I see. Yeah. But that was before, you know, computers were, had as many nice things for them, so. I see, yeah. Yeah, I think it's pretty important. And also um, many of these, uh, so, uh, so like, like if you want to directly apply uh, these machine learning methods, I believe most of these papers have publicly, like a GitHub, public GitHub repository where you can um, kind of just um, run it out of the box um, mm -hmm. or with very little like startup work um, on, on like a test example. So, uh, yeah, so I think of all the papers listed here, um, maybe except this very recent one, they all have, um, some public GitHub code that you can use and also look at if you're implementing yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have and then one other question: have, have 
when people have have people tried this on sort of more natural images, you know, and found success as well? Uh, yeah. So there's actually um, not much work in compute computer vision uh, in general. I would say on this topic, but there is this one paper by Krokov et al. And maybe I can just send like also a list of um, maybe these references too. Uh, but they try uh, they tried it for some I believe few shot learning tests and they found that it was successful as well. Um, and I guess this this image is kind of like the intuition they were using. I think they may have also tried retrieval, but I'm a it's been a while since I've read that paper, so maybe I need to double check. But uh, yeah, they've seen some success, but in general, I think there's not too many papers, so it's hard to say. Um, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and I don't, I'm not sure whether you were there for this earlier discussion, but they also there's also kind of this idea floating around that there's actually like a number you can compute kind of that may tell you like how hyperbolic it is, oh, yeah. and therefore like how likely a hyperbolic representation is to work. Um, it's called delta hyperbolicity, um, if you're curious. And I think they're, um, actually, I'm not sure, but I am, uh, I think it's likely that there's like code also to compute it online. And I do remember reading some papers that said that um, uh, like, if this number correlates with like how good the performance of hyperbolic methods are. Mm -hmm. uh, that if you're thinking of, you know, maybe trying it out on some natural image data set, uh, maybe this could be like a step. And I believe it's also mentioned in this paper as well. Mm -hmm. So perhaps if their code is public, so I haven't checked to see if their code is public here, but they may have like some way of computing this for image data sets and it may be like helpful to like also compute this number too uh, for data sets you're interested in. Yeah. Thank you, great talk. Thanks. Thank you, Jeffrey. So we are running a bit late. Uh, let's end our talk here. And if anyone else has uh, other questions, feel free to uh, comment under our YouTube video. Yeah, we will uh, upload the recording to our YouTube channel later. Let's give uh, Jeffrey another round of virtual applause. Thank you, Jeffrey, for the great talk. And thank you, everyone, for coming here today. See you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey.